Japan Station is made possible in part by Patreon support. If you would like to make sure that I can keep bringing you more content like this, then head on over to japankyo.com slash Patreon and sign up for as little as $1 a month. Welcome to Japan Station, a production of japankyo.com. I'm your host, Tony Vega. As you may know if you listen to the show regularly, I basically do anything and everything related to this show and japankyo.com and social media and I don't know, you name it, I probably do it. The only thing that I don't do is really the artwork because I just can't really do that. So every once in a while, you know, I spend a little money and I hire somebody to do that for me because, you know, I think it's worth it. I I, I love uh, seeing some fun art and things like that, you know, that, that come out of my mind and having people actually like turn them into reality. So, you know, I spend money on things like that. So at the end of the day, I'm, I'm operating 100% in the red. Any revenue that I bring in through like Patreon or ads on the website or kimitodesigns.com, the uh, t-shirt shop, you know, it, it's really not making up for <laughs> all the stuff that I spend, but it is what it is. I'm not complaining. I, I basically am saying this because I'm trying to tell you that I really, really, really do appreciate it when people help me out in some way with this uh, crazy thing I'm doing here. Uh, you know, I love it. I love it. I love it. But, you know, some help is always appreciated. And I got that help uh, when I was working on uh, episode 65. I was talking to Dr. Jan Bardsley about her book, Michael Masquerade. And uh, that was a fun conversation. So if you haven't listened to that yet, go check it out. It's about Michael and Geisha. But anyway, after talking to her, she ended up getting me in touch with Dr. Rebecca Copeland, who is my guest today. And she is a professor of Japanese language and literature at Washington University in St. Louis. And as of June 1st, she is an author of fiction as well, because she just published her first novel, The Kimono Tattoo. Uh, This book is a mystery novel, and it's a really, really fun book. I was in the perfect mood to read it because, well, lately I've been reading a lot of academic stuff, so I was in the perfect mood to read some uh, good fiction. And uh, basically the story revolves around Ruth Bennett. She is a translator. She's fluent in Japanese. And one day somebody comes a knock in and says, hey, I want you to translate this new book by this mysterious author that everybody thought was dead. And then that quickly devolves into this whole crazy murder involving uh, this woman with a kimono tattoo. And there's Yakuza, there's the Kyoto underworld, there's dog fighting, there's tattoos, there's a whole bunch of things, including a cursed kimono with a very long history in this sort of kimono uh, creating family in Kyoto. So it's a really fun, fun book that delves into a little bit of Japanese history and culture and uh, if you're interested in picking it up, of course, you can find it on Amazon. And if you want to use the Japankyo Amazon affiliate link, well, you can click on the link in the show notes or go to japankyo.com slash Amazon. It won't cost you anything extra and it will support the show. So again, japankyo.com slash Amazon, the kimono tattoo. But anyway, of course, we talk about the book, some of the inspirations behind it, that cursed kimono <laughs> and a few other things. So hope you enjoy it. Here is my conversation with Dr. Rebecca Copeland. I was reading your bio and then of course, you know, I, I read the book too and it, it seems like you you based a lot of aspects of, of Ruth, the main character in the book, um on, on, on yourself, right? Like traditional dance and translation and um I, I believe your parents were missionaries as well, yeah. right? Like it, it, so. Yes. <laughs> it's scarily close to what I've actually experienced in my life. So I, you know, yeah, it's Ruth is not me. Uh her parents uh-huh. are not my parents, but there's a lot <laughs> of similarity for sure <laughs> sure so then was your first uh how, can i how can i put it um did you end up in japan then also because your parents were missionaries yeah it, uh, actually i was born in japan um because my parents were missionaries there but it, as soon as I w- well, actually, as soon as my mother was able to travel, they left Japan. I was only probably three weeks old. 
um, and they they returned to the United States. So I didn't have the luxury of growing up in Japan. So in that respect, Ruth um, sort of represents maybe my dream <laughs> had I grown up in <laughs> Japan, but I, I didn't. So I, I, I don't have the advantage of uh, being bilingual. Uh-huh. And and you are not secretly secretly solving crimes on the side either, right? Not yet, not yet. <laughs> that could happen. <laughs> uh, so then, w- when did you end up going back to Japan? Like, okay, for the so first time? like of your own volition. <laughs> Oh, well, kind of. It's sort of a um, middle ground. I was a junior in college, uh-huh. and my parents uh-huh. had uh, decided to return to Japan as missionaries. So they had been in Japan for, or they had been missionaries for over eight years before I was born, mm-hmm. and then they decided to go back for another term. And um, so I was a junior in college, and they. Mm. suggested that I go with them. And I have to say, I was not thrilled by that idea. <laughs> I, I was having uh-huh. such a good time in college and I didn't, you uh-huh. know, the idea of, of now being 20 years old and living with my parents, it just didn't seem like so much fun. But somehow I was persuaded and that year really changed my life. So I became, oh. that's when I became fascinated with um, Japanese dance and kimono and uh, Mm -hmm. struggling to learn Japanese language. And then I went into graduate work after I I, um, finished college. I went to university and returned to Japan a few years later to do my my dissertation research. And then I've just been going Mm -hmm. back ever since as as often as I can. Mm Mm-hmm. So were were you, where were you first? Were you in Kyoto or were you somewhere else? No, so the first, my first uh, encounter with with Japan was in Fukuoka. So my parents were missionaries there in Kyushu. And um, then Uh when I went back uh, as an adult, adult, um, uh, well, I went back when they were there to visit in in, in uh, Fukuoka, they went back to their same position. And so I spent mm-hmm. a year in Fukuoka. When I graduated uh, college and went to, to grad school, I returned to Japan. Um, and I went to Tokyo at that point, where all the, mm-hmm. you know, the libraries are. And, uh, well, mm-hmm. there are libraries everywhere, but the, the research mm-hmm. was in Tokyo. So I I sure. lived in Tokyo for over five years um, and then mm-hmm. returned Every now and then, and I really didn't get to know Kyoto until um, really uh, I was almost fifty. So oh, huh. Kyoto oh. is a new discovery for me. Well, I, I ask because I mean, obviously, the book takes place in Kyoto, but you you mention a lot of places that uh, you, you make very specific mentions of like the Keihan train line and the Fushimi <laughs> like train station and certain aspects that I think your average tourist might not you know be familiar with um, you've obviously been there quite a bit of time and you're familiar with the with the city so um, like did you do a lot of research for writing the book or were you already like pretty familiar with the city where it was all kind of like in your head and it was yes. fairly easy? So what happened was um, in 2004, I had an opportunity to teach for a year at the Kyoto Center for Japanese Studies, um, which is a mm-hmm. consortium of American universities and um, they offer uh, coursework there for American students who, who go over then to uh, Kyoto to, to study. So I was invited to be the visiting professor there for a year, mm-hmm. and I lived behind the Kyoto Zoo. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> and so I was sort of in between uh, Heian Shrine and Nanzenji Temple. Uh-huh. And that uh-huh. year, then I just wandered all over, mostly Higashiyama area of Kyoto, and got very familiar uh-huh. with uh, Philosopher's Path and so forth. And so that's um, that's where the most of the story takes place in the kimono tattoo Mm -hmm. and um, I didn't have to do very much research because I was just familiar Mm -hmm. with having uh, lived there Mm. what what about um like any any favorite places any places that you often found yourself going back to when you were there oh I well I love to just ramble along the philosopher's path but I like to go Mm -hmm. further afield and so if you go um, a little further away from that, up to um, uh, towards the Ichijoji area, up to uh, mm-hmm. Shisendo is a beautiful um, sort of villa or temple, 
And mm-hmm. then beyond that is Tanuki Dani, where nobody goes. And um, yeah, you know what? I don't think I've ever even heard of that. <laughs> yeah, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> and it's another. It's sort of. It looks kind of like Kiyomizu Temple, um, uh-huh, the same uh-huh. kind of a temple that's built up on on a platform on stilts, sort of. Yeah. Um, uh-huh. But it's very. It's sort of a miniature size, and it, it's very huh. remote, and it's hard to. You have to climb a lot of stairs to get to it, so and nobody much goes there. But it's a lot of. So I like going to the places that are sort of forgotten and moss covered and <laughs> yeah. sort of secret. Yeah. <laughs> huh. Okay. I will make a mental note of that to go check that out next time I'm in Kyoto because, yeah, like I I, I lived in the area for a while and I would go back sometimes like every weekend and I I didn't know about that place so thank you. Yeah, um, there's so much huh. in Kyoto. You don't. I mean, there, there's there's so many places that uh, most of most tourists go to a, on a set route. So it's pretty mm-hmm. easy to to step off that path and find mm-hmm. sort of hidden gems. I think. <laughs> yeah, like one one thing that I would do sometimes is um. So on the Keihan train line, there's the Sanjo station and there's the shijo station uh-huh. and and so i would get off at one of the other and then you know walk around the area and then end up you know going back in the other train station and in the in the on the walk between the two stations you know i would explore like the little streets on the side and i think there's like a little fish market in one of those areas yeah and there's a lot of really really interesting things you know off in the little side streets and, and it's 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 fun and in the main like shopping area of course there's tons of just you know typical stores too I, that's what I love about Kyoto or, or just any mm-hmm. place in Japan, really. It's just mm-hmm. wandering and yeah. just uncover so many interesting things that not tourist, not, not your typical attraction, but nevertheless, very, you know, fascinating things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, something that I, that I found interesting that I hadn't ever heard anybody talk about was uh you mentioned some like tunnels under the philosopher's path <laughs> like what, what can you tell me about that because I, like i said i never heard of that so <laughs> well i'm still looking for them <laughs> okay. uh, um I, I was sort of inspired because uh, the philosopher's path is, is built alongside uh, canals that were made oh, in the okay, um okay. the late 19th century or or the sort of mm-hmm. the early meiji period period after the capital was taken from Kyoto, right, and um, Mm -hmm. shifted to Tokyo. So Kyoto was kind of bereft at that point and uh, sort of was being left behind by the modern movement. And that's when Mm -hmm. um, visionaries, I guess, in Kyoto decided to to um, invest in a new industrial project of of drawing water from Biwa Lake, Lake Biwa, uh, Biwako mm-hmm. to to um, the Kamo River, and they had mm-hmm. to create all of these canals and tunnels uh, in order to to create that that passageway, and so a number of the remnants of this. These great, this great work um, still remain in, at Nanzinji. If you have noticed, they, there's this beautiful aqueduct um, close mm. to Nanzinji Temple, and, and that was part of this uh, works, great works project. And then the Philosopher's Path was uh, the is along the canal that was built to to draw water to Kyoto from uh, Lake Biwa. So there's there's this you know amazing. Uh, <laughs> Uh, history of this mm-hmm. 19th century in, um, project, and I don't know that there's a lot of tunnels still there, but there were mm. tunnels and canals that were built as part of this. So that um, okay. much of that was my imagination. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. Well, then, speaking of, of like kind of things that were. were inspired or based on like actual history like what about the the kimono that we it's kind of like i guess that's one of the central focuses of the book there's this kimono that has this kind of like cursed history um and that you know kind of the events in a way revolve around that in in the book but was was that inspired by anything directly is that like based on anything real or or was that kind of like hmm let me let me make something up that seems really fun that, that i can play with yeah so I'm not as 
I'm not imaginative enough, I think, to just pull something out of the air. So I did have, there are, there are a number of different sources for this idea. And mm-hmm. um, probably, well, let me tell you two. So the first uh-huh. one is, um, there was a graduate student at Washington University named um, Terry Milhaup. And uh, mm-hmm. she she wrote a, a brilliant dissertation about the afterlife of a Japanese textile. And um, you'll mm. be interested to know that she um, she did much of her research on a fragment of um, Suji, uh, Sujigahana textile that's in the museum at University of Hawaii. So, um, oh. yeah, Terry, okay. um, she was a, a, a student at at the, I guess, a Kailua High School in, in Hawaii, and she's, oh. you know, she grew up in Hawaii. So, <laughs> so, okay. so it's interesting. There's this Hawaiian connection. Anyway, um, uh-huh. this, 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 she studied this um, fragment of a beautiful textile that had one one point been a, a gorgeous robe, a gorgeous kosode for an um, aristocratic Japanese woman, and um, as it happens in the in the past, when a kimono was no longer serviceable for whatever reason, um, it sometimes was refashioned into altar altar banners or altar cloths, and so this uh-huh. this actually happened, and um, uh-huh. so I was interested in in the way kimono are repurposed, um, hmm. and so that the, so that's one. Um, one factor, and so we see that in the story that this kimono mm-hmm. is just too beautiful to destroy, and so the the fragments of the kimono are repurposed into different um, banners and cloths, and and then the other sort of um, inspiration was from writers, Japanese writers like the writer Enchi Humiko, who mm-hmm. um, sort of writes about the way kimono or uh, masks, no masks, sort of can absorb or inherit the spirit of their creators. So I think Mm -hmm. um, it's not unusual to think that it could be possible that an artist who has invested so much of their energy into creating something beautiful uh, would Mm -hmm. leave some of their spirit behind, a trace of their spirit in the object itself. Mm Um, and that also mm-hmm. goes in Japan, you have this notion that things that are long lived, like um, um, paintbrushes or, for calligraphy or needles mm-hmm. for uh, embroidery, things that are used over and over again after many years, sort of inherit the spirit of the people that have have enjoyed them or used them or um, benefited from them. So you can't just throw them away. You have to give mm. them a, a little uh, a kuyo or a ceremony to mm-hmm. divest them of this energy, this spirit. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think that this is something that I've heard before, and I'm pretty sure if I'm remembering correctly, a character in the book says it too. But like a kimono ends up owning you, something like yeah. that, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And so that's another thing is that um, kimono are made out of living things, right? So um, mm-hmm. the the dye is sometimes uh, well in the old days the dye would be extracted from living plants or insects maybe, and um, the cloth or silk is is taken from the bodies of cocoons of of uh, you know silk silkworms and and so there's a sort of living quality about a kimono and then uh, mm-hmm. when a woman or when a man wears it there it's uh, so close to their body it sort of uh, again uh, inherits something of their energy and spirit and mm-hmm. owns them in a way <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so um th- have you like done research with like makers of kimonos like modern day have you have you talked to a lot of them because I, I like in the book it kind of, i guess ruth was it the the she works on a book that is kind of related to that and so then that's how she becomes interested in kimono so i'm just wondering like how did you get into the whole kimono thing what what sparked your interest oh so well when i was um a, um, a college student in in Japan. The first time I studied Japanese dance, and wearing kimono is intrinsic mm-hmm. to to Japanese dance. So much of the movement is is built into the way uh, your body moves while you're in kimono, or the way you you use mm-hmm. your sleeves. Um, 
to to dance and so forth. And so I've I've been fascinated by kimono for a long time. And then it just so happened Mm -hmm. that I wrote my dissertation on a woman writer named Mm -hmm. Uno Chio, who um, Mm -hmm. became a kimono designer. And so kimono was very important to, to her. And mm-hmm. I, so I'm interested in the sort of expressiveness of kimono mm-hmm. as as um, fabric, but also the way writers um, use kimono in their literature, in their stories, the description mm-hmm. of the kimono to create a sort of second language, I guess, or to mm-hmm. use the kimono to describe character. So yeah, I've always mm-hmm. been interested in kimono. <laughs> Have you have you had the opportunity to wear some like absurdly expensive kimono? <laughs> oh, well, um, for dance recitals, I would wear nice kimono. Um, uh-huh. And then while I was living in Kyoto, I would go to the um, secondhand, sh- a lot of secondhand shops in Kyoto. And uh-huh. I have bought a number of secondhand kimono, but uh, mm-hmm. nothing very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you, you, I like, well, I... I you know, many years ago, when I first began to really learn about this, um, you know, I would hear, oh, like, for example, kids for their graduation, like university graduation, right, they would rent kimono. Yes. And so, you know, like, I think many people that don't know too much about Japan, they just assume, oh, everybody just has a kimono at home. And maybe they have like some cheaper one. But for a special occasion, it's very common to rent one because they're just so pricey, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So what what about um, dance though? Then um, so you do Nihon Buyo, right? This traditional form of, of yeah. Japanese dance, which um, I you know I, I have to admit, like until until a few years ago, I didn't know that much about. And then I had the opportunity to interview a a dancer of the Fujima style oh. that he came to perform here in Hawaii. Wonderful! And it it was a really really interesting experience. And and then you know I, I learned so much about this area that I pretty much knew nothing about until then. And so um, how, how has that been like? How did you get involved with that? And, and, and can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Um, so when I was a college student, a, f- a friend recommended uh, studying dance just as another way of getting to know Japanese culture. Uh, because I was living with my parents, I felt a little bit isolated from Um, people my age and Mm -hmm. learning more I mean most of my my classmates had homestays and I mean my homestay was my parents so I wasn't getting that Mm, immersion into (laughs) Japanese culture so they Mm -hmm. recommended I study dance and um, it was just a wonderful experience for you know of course learning movement but also learning uh, learning to learn I think that Mm -hmm. the way that dance is taught in uh, is very different in I assume in oh, Japan uh-huh. than in the United States. I mean, mm-hmm. I don't, I don't study dance in the United States, so I'm not sure. But there's mm-hmm. so much um, of of watching your your the the sensei and um, uh, the sensei sort of mirrors the the movement for you and tries to get you to move from within your own um, I guess. Uh, understanding of things so it's at, in the beginning you, your movement isn't perfect <laughs> uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. really but it's more mm-hmm. of of sort of an appreciation of what it should I don't know I'm not explaining this very well but uh, I think mm-hmm. that the the teachers try to encourage you to develop your own understanding of of dance so that it becomes um, organic from your own body mm-hmm. rather than you just um, going through the motions, you you have to try to mm. uh, up, sort of um, embody the the motions, right, right, right. and right. and so I I learned a lot about sort of the appreciation of art and mm-hmm. the slowness of 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 acquiring um, proficiency that you don't rush it you 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 do what you can do at your pace kind of mm-hmm. at least. That's hmm. the way we were taught. There were only two of us in the class, and I guess we were both slow. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, was it? Um, how can I put it? Like the the teacher, Ruth's teacher in in the in the book is is a very she, well. She seems well. Obviously, she you 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 put point out in the book that she's you know a respected figure in in the in the world of, of dance in in within the novel. Um, but um, 
it, it seems like she's very much like the typical kind of sensei where she's a you know, rather strict and you know the teacher is the teacher the students the student and and you just have to you know watch and copy um was that your experience like uh when you were learning dance yes uh, the um the the teacher really mirrors um mm-hmm. the 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 performance or she mirrors the the dance and try mm-hmm. she would uh, well i I studied in in uh, Fukuoka and then I studied again as an old much older person in in Kyoto mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. Um, at that point we had access to video and we could watch the um, performances on video and my sensei got very angry <laughs> not very angry but oh. she didn't like that we watch video she says you know this oh. is you know this is not intellectual this isn't an intellectual kind of you see the video and you try to uh, copy it like a robot it has to come from within you so um no don't watch those videos she got so (laughs) she would (laughs) send us home with a a video a cassette tape a recording Uh of the music and we would have to listen to it and listen to it and try to um piece the the movement in our head in our imagination in our head without actually moving Uh our bodies um and Hmm. and in that way, sort of try to absorb the music and the mute and know how the movement is supposed to go. Anyway, uh, she was mm-hmm. just an amazing um, sensei. That was um, Nishikawa Senrei was her name, mm-hmm. Sendei Sensei. She's uh, unfortunately she passed away quite young, but mm-hmm. she also per, uh, created her own dance. She didn't just. Um, teach the dances from the past but she choreographed new dances as well and oh, just an uh-huh. amazing artist <laughs> yeah 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 well it's like the the oh, not not exactly the same but like even in the tattoo world i've talked to people where it's like you know uh the, w- with those really strict teachers where it's like they don't even tell you what you're doing wrong it's like at least for a year you just have to watch and, and then try right. to copy and then <laughs> and then maybe they might tell you every once in a while it's like oh hey don't do that <laughs> Exactly, exactly. Because, yeah. again, you know, she wanted us to, to figure it out ourselves, I guess, so it would come from yeah. within us and not mm-hmm. not us overthinking it. Yeah, yeah. It's, I think that's probably a much lengthier process. But if yeah. you can figure it out, then it really does stick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so... Uh, what a, so I, I have to ask you just really briefly. So, have you been writing fiction for a long time? Was this something that you've been <laughs> wanting to do? Because I know you have this long, you know, academic career, and you know, like like you mentioned, your dissertation, uh, and and you've done a lot of stuff on translation as well. Um, but uh, how how did the novel come about then? Oh, you, that's such a good question. I, um, I. I wanted to write. I've I've thought about how wonderful it would be to write. I never thought that I really could to write fiction, and mm-hmm. um, I I just sort of I came to a place in my career where I felt like I've I've written the academic studies I I need to write, and now mm-hmm. is my chance uh, to begin to work on some fiction. And so mm-hmm. this 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 um, novel is really my first work of fiction mm-hmm. <laughs> and mm-hmm. it I started it in around 2012 and mm. just uh, kept sort of sketching things out and sketching things and going to Kyoto and thinking about it and and writing chapters and chapters and I, I probably wrote more I probably wrote enough for two books and then had to cut a lot because it was it wasn't a good story it was all me telling Mm. uh lessons i guess giving lessons (laughs) Mm. Mm -hmm. so that was the hard part for me the hard part was to make my teacher voice um uh take a back seat (laughs) and Mm -hmm. try to let the creative voice come forward Mm -hmm. well as as i've told you i I really enjoyed it and you know like one one aspect of of the story that i found interesting was that there's it's kind of there's two threads going on, right? There's kind of Ruth's personal story with her family, yeah. and there's the 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 mystery with this uh, cursed uh, kimono, and and you know the, uh, somebody that ends up dying related to this kimono. But um, and and so part way through the book, maybe halfway or a little bit more, you know, the story switches focus slightly over to Ruth's um, you know family kind of side of things, and I, I was not expecting that, but it was really interesting, and then that that added a whole other layer, kept me really engaged all the way till the very end. So. I I enjoyed it. I, I do recommend the book. Thank you um, so much. Do you, 
Do you plan on, on it seems like you, you at least are thinking about doing a, a follow up to this? I hope so. If I um mm -hmm. I'd hope to be further along. Um mm -hmm. it's just working in academics it's really hard for me to clear my head and sure. and, and become creative <laughs> but um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i feel like the novel ends um it, mm -hmm. it it's complete um mm -hmm. it, it's a complete story but if i can i would like to continue writing about ruth and and her mm -hmm. friend maho uh, they kind of they mm -hmm. still live with me and they still um tell me stories and i sort of feel like uh, i gotta keep writing i need to to <laughs> keep telling the stories and i've actually gotten about three chapters in to Another novel featuring Ruth that um, tentative, tentatively is titled "The Blood Brocade." Blood Brocade, and it uh -huh. it's um, features Nishijin weaving. So th oh. th this this novel deals with Yuzen dying, but the mm -hmm. next one is Nishijin weaving, and then. And then I would like Ruth to travel, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and uh, I want her to go to Fukuoka, and maybe we will look at Hakata oh, Hakata fun. dolls or uh, Hakata oh. um, weaving or, or pottery. There's just so much art that I think Ruth would yeah. enjoy. <laughs> but of course, yeah, people yeah. will have to die when that happens, so <laughs> it, it, uh, it is treacherous. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah, that's the excuse to get things going, right? Someone's yeah. gonna die. <laughs> but that's how these mysteries. I think it was what, the uh, Angela Angela Lansbury was it like the murder she wrote? Right? Uh -huh. There's this there's this theory that it was she was the killer because it's always like somebody oh, around her always ends up dying. So there's this right. you know, silly theory that. <laughs> uh -huh. So that Ruth, she could really be a poison woman. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so uh, something else that I noticed that, that you're involved in on the, I guess that you would say, it seems like on the more fiction side of things with the, was it Blue Ridge Yamamba? Okay, um, yeah. <laughs> what, what What is that? And could you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, another colleague uh, of mine, uh, Linda Ehrlich, and I put together a collection of, of works on the Yamamba. And mm -hmm. this collection that we have, it's called Yamamba in Search of the Japanese Mountain Witch. It's um, a, a collection of poems and short stories and um, interviews with with performers about how the Yamamba um, image has inspired them. So the Yamamba is this um, Japanese legendary figure or mythical figure. She is, uh, I mean, she is fe uh, orient described as female and um, usually described as old, living in the mountains and has a very complex character. She either, she can be deadly if you get mm -hmm. lost in her the mountain fastness, she could kill you. Um, mm -hmm. Or she's very nurturing and maternal. She's known to give, she, she was known to have given birth to lots and lots of babies and often help mm. people when they are struggling. So she's, she's very dangerous, but also very gentle. <laughs> uh, so mm -hmm. this very complex character, kind of like the force of nature, right? She's kind of like nature mm -hmm. itself, awesome, mysterious. And um, in the medieval period, there's there were lots of legends about these wicked, wild women in the mountains. Um, mm -hmm. And then toward, in the 20th century in Japan, women writers began to sort of reappropriate the Yamamba uh, figure as a is an image of strength, but also subversiveness mm. as a way of sort of countering um, patriarchal pressure and um, striking back at at um, the status quo, social social pressure, and so forth. Anyway, so Linda Ehrlich mm. and I were very interested in how the Yamamba has uh, inspired artists, and mm. we ourselves wrote some works inspired by the Yamamba. So my work was the Blue Ridge Yamamba in which I have 
the Yamamba appearing to a an American woman in the Blue Ridge Mountains, oh. um, and the the American woman is quite surprised to see the the Japanese Yamamba there. Um, and the Yamamba says, why are you surprised? I'm all powerful. Why shouldn't I travel across the ocean <laughs> right. and appear before you? And, and, and the idea also is sort of that um, this sort of fear of of single women is universal. It's not limited mm-hmm. to Japan. <laughs> so mm-hmm. we, we can find it in the United States as well with our crazy cat ladies and, and all kinds of... <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> So yeah, uh, I, I think the yeah. I mean, I, I probably became familiar with the word through um, like this kind of like fashion trend that happened in like the nineties, oh, yes. early two thousands, right? Like, there's this whole gyaru culture, right? That's and right. then one kind of subdivision of that was the yamamba, which were these really really dark faced. Um, like they, I guess they would either I, they probably tanned themselves tanned. to get that dark, eye, uh-huh. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that's how makeup, I became familiar yeah. with it, but. Yeah. So we have it. And then I look have... up. What is this Yamamba thing? <laughs> <laughs> one one in one of the chapters in our mm-hmm. book is a discussion of of um, Laura, Dr. Laura Miller created a, a sh- what she calls a shrine box, so a display that that includes images of the traditional Yamamba, but also this this gal Yamamba that you're talking about. And so it's very mm-hmm. uh, creative and <laughs> mm, brings us up to modern times. Nice. Huh. <laughs> um, well, that, that sounds very interesting. Is that is that out? Is that book out? That comes out um, June 22nd from Stonebridge Press. Oh, okay. So both both uh, the Kimono Tattoo and Blue Ridge Yamamba coming out in June. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> All right, so plenty to read there. Yeah, I didn't plan uh, it that way. It's just a ha- that's how it happens. <laughs> nice. Okay. Um, one last question that I, I want to ask uh, involves something else that I saw in your bio, where you you taught about Japan at a correctional facility. It seems so. Like that's right. Can you tell me a little bit about that? What what was that experience like? How did that happen? Oh, thank. Well, thank you so much for asking me about that. I hardly mm-hmm. ever get the chance to talk about it. It was just a, a remarkable experience. At at Washington mm-hmm. University, we have a prison education program that uh, takes faculty into a um, medium security prison and the mm-hmm. um, offering courses so that the incarcerated men can earn an associate's degree while they're incarcerated and the idea is that then when they when they leave prison hopefully that they will um, have a better chance at success and Hmm. sort of break the cycle of recidivism and and Mm -hmm. when I learned about this program I offered to teach a course on Japanese civilization and Mm -hmm. um, the um, I think, you know, people were sort of surprised, well, what are they going to do with Japanese civilization? Uh, Mm -hmm. Isn't studying Japan kind of a um, fringe or isn't it kind of elite? Uh, You know, I don't know. Um, People think Mm -hmm. you need to study basic writing and, um, you know, statistics or these sort of more practical things. But really, studying Japan is another way of training your mind and learning to think more critically, I think, um, comparatively. And I've found Mm -hmm. that when my students, regardless of where they are in the world, um, study another culture, a culture that's so different from their own, it always Mm -hmm. makes them understand themselves better. And so I think Mm -hmm. this was a really good experience for the the students that I had in the in the prison and it was also a really good experience for me to just really Mm -hmm. to appreciate how 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 eager they were to learn Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they didn't take Mm -hmm. things for granted and were quite Mm -hmm. uh, appreciative um it was a struggle you know because you can't um, there's you can't tell them go to the library and do this research project. Right, right? right. there isn't a library. Right. Um, you have to bring things in, but you're limited on what you can bring in. Uh, you can't mm-hmm. you can't just come carrying in your dictionary or, or your different books because everything has to be inspected. 
Um, mm-hmm. You can't bring in movies. You can't bring in all kinds oh. of audiovisual things that I rely on in my everyday teaching. So it it also mm-hmm. challenged me to ref- sort of rely more on telling stories <laughs> in, mm. in in that occasion. <laughs> So by Japanese civilization, does that mean like you you covered some history and culture and kind of like a combination of, of both, right? So it, mm-hmm. with this, I taught the same class that I teach on the Washington University campus. We start with the Jomon era and uh, go all the way up to well, at that time we were going up to Heisei, <laughs> mm-hmm. but um, uh, so it's a very quick journey through through Japanese history and looking at high points of Japanese culture. Along the way, mm-hmm. so we you know we talked about um, the importance of China, uh, the um, mm-hmm. Buddhism, um, what is Shinto. We mm-hmm. looked at the a chapter from the Tale of Genji and a chapter oh, from wow. the Tale of the Heike, and um, mm-hmm. then in the modern period we considered work a work of Tanizaki uh, Junichiro, mm-hmm. and just sort of jumped around. Um, and tried to give everybody a, a taste of things Japanese. <laughs> mm. Did you receive uh, any like positive feedback or any comments like saying something like, "Oh, I had no idea about this, but you know, now this is very interesting" or something like that? Yeah, I mean, it, literally, most of the the men in the class didn't ha- didn't have a, a very broad understanding or. Um, uh, access to Japan. Many of them were were familiar with video games and sure. ca- uh, Dragon Ball Z, <laughs> of and, course, yeah. Uh, <laughs> things that that's the actually, gateway for so many people. So. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and and of course the you know this misunderstandings of samurai and samurai culture and honor right. and these sort of uh, stereotypes that I kind of had to break break down a little bit, and uh, so mm-hmm, they were. Mm-hmm really enjoyed um learning and relearning things about mm-hmm. about Japan. I think mm. one of the sort of poignant aspects of this though is that for most of the people in my class they'll never be able to go to Japan because mm-hmm. um they are convicted felons and would yeah. not be allowed to enter. <laughs> and wow. so if, you know that also impressed on me how important it is for me to capture for them uh, the experience mm-hmm. of travel and yeah, and um, yeah. uh, experience of another culture. Yeah, yeah. No, that that that's a wonderful point. I mean, for you know, most of my life I've been interested in Japan. I've gotten to go there just so many times, and you know. It, for so many reasons, whether it's, you know, the fact that I can afford a plane ticket or the fact that I've been able to, you know, go to college and, and study these things and go to grad school and study the Japanese language like that. That's a privilege that many people don't get to do. Right. So that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. But, for, uh, you know, for me, it was a privilege. It was a privilege for me to have the opportunity to meet these these men and to um, really be. Uh, sort of blown away by how mm-hmm. diligent they were and just how eager they were to learn and to mm-hmm. be exposed to something new and it, it made me realize how exa- exactly what you said like we take this for granted mm-hmm. we just assume we have access to knowledge <laughs> and mm-hmm. um you know exploring the world but th- that's yeah. not what everybody can uh easily acquire <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the means and time to like mm-hmm. study these things, which, you know, the Japanese language alone, like trying to learn that, that takes so much time that, you know, if, if you're, for example, you can't, don't have enough food to, you know, don't have enough money to, you know, bring food on the table, right? Then you, you can't right. be doing that. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that, that's wonderful. I mean, it, it's so easy to just say like, oh, Jap- Japan is for the nerds. And, and, you know, it's only the nerds that get interested. In, but there's so yeah. much to learn there that, that you can, you know, I think, grow from that, right? So That's right. Yeah. And so again, thank, thank you, you know, for sharing I think, that. Yeah, yeah I, I think if you're living in a small cell, um, to be yeah. able to travel um, a, a, imaginatively to another culture and and be exposed to new ideas and different ideas and um, mm-hmm. sort of um, test your your understanding of the world that way. It, it's it's 
uh, it's another way again to better appreciate your current circumstance. Yeah. Oh, well, th- thank you so much for, for that. That that's an area that I was uh, really interested in, in in exploring because I've I've never talked about with anyone that that has that sort of experience. So th- thank thank you for that. Well, thank you. Um, yeah. So um, yeah. No, I of course I will include the link in the show notes for the book, the Kimono Tattoos. I, thank I highly you. recommend it, and and I I do look forward to further adventures with Ruth. If if that materializes, I I will happily take another dive into that world so oh, good. I, I look forward to that <laughs> thank you that gives me incentive to go back to <laughs> find Ruth again <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah to kill somebody off again <laughs> yeah where is she now she's dangerous <laughs> Again, the book is called The Kimono Tattoo. Go check it out. There will be links in the show notes. But of course, you can also use japankyo.com slash Amazon if you want to support the show and uh, send me a few pennies. (laughs) All right. So The Kimono Tattoo. Thank you so much to Dr. Copeland and Dr. Jan Barsley, who got me in touch with Dr. Copeland. I would have never, I think, uh, discovered this book had it not been for her. And I'm glad that I did. So uh, if you have any questions or comments, send them over to mail at japanstationpodcast.com. Remember to follow on Facebook and Twitter at Japankyo News. And don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review, and tell a friend about the show if you really enjoy it and you want to make sure that this show keeps on growing and that more people keep on finding out about it. Also, thank you so much to You Know Me for providing the opening and closing song, Oedo Controller. And that does it for this episode. Hopefully the next episode will be out on June 15th. I think it will be okay, but I have to admit I am very, very busy at the moment and there's a tiny chance that I may have to travel to the mainland as well. For anybody that's not aware, uh, I live in Hawaii and there's a chance that I may have to go to Florida. If that happens, then yeah, my schedule will be completely thrown off. But um, hopefully I can get something out for June 15th. Uh, So keep an eye out for that. If you subscribe, then you won't have to check the website or anything. You know, it's just going to pop up in your podcast app. Uh, But uh, also, don't forget to check out Ichimon Japan, my other podcast about Japan. Uh, The latest episode is uh, episode number 44. In that one, we're talking about Taketori Monogatari, uh, the story of Kaguya Hime, one of the most famous, famous, famous uh, Japanese folktales. And uh, we're asking the question of whether that story proves that aliens have visited Japan. (laughs) We, uh, yeah, it gets pretty silly, but there's a lot of actual real uh, fact based information in there about the history and different aspects of the story. So if you're interested in learning about that, then go check it out. You can find it on your podcast app of choice or at japankyo.com slash Ichimon Japan. Thank you so much for listening. And remember, go find your miniature pony. Just do it!